it was incredible to imagine that the Ottomans ruled the world. Uh, they ruled the whole of North Africa, the whole of the Middle East, including Mecca and Medina, uh, and Egypt, and of course Turkey, and not to speak of their, their ruling of the Balkans. They were the, the first, if you like, Muslim empire who ruled uh, non-Muslims in a very equitable um, way. Uh, they, they were tolerant, they were moderate, they were not extremist in any way. They didn't slaughter all the Christians uh, because they were Christians. And um, what Eugene does in this book is, is, is talk about the past, but also really is interested in why and how did the Ottomans collapse. Because, of course, their collapse just before and during World War I brought about the, the modern Middle East as we know it. And I'll be asking him um, about that uh, as well. So, um, uh, so two key questions. Why and how did it collapse? And um, uh, how, how did the collapse create uh, what today is the Middle East? And how does things like the Arab Spring and all fit into the legacy left by um, the, uh, uh, the Ottomans? So, I mean, let's start. I mean, am I, have, I, have I exaggerated this too much? I mean, I mean, you must have been struck by the Ottomans. And, um, I mean, I, describe to us, you know, how they came about and, um, and, and how they dominated so much of the world. Ahmed, oh, thank you so much for the warmth of your introduction and greetings, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you for the seventh edition of the Lahore Literary Festival. My first time in Pakistan. I'm hoping that your response will ensure that I get to come back again. <laughs> I asked for that. It's very interesting that you describe a, a, a sense of novelty about the Ottoman Empire because in my education, the Ottomans were always taught as one of three great world empires, the Mughals, the Safavids, and the Ottomans, who between them had ensured that Islam dominated Asia and the Western world right through the early modern period. And that this was the center of culture, civilization, and innovation for the 16th and 17th and into the 18th century. In a sense, it's really only in the 19th century that you find that the Ottomans, like the Islamic world, are forced into retreat by the outsurge of new ideas and technologies from Europe that made Europe such a dominant force in the 19th century. Until that point, you would have said that there had been a kind of division of the civilized world between those three great Islamic empires. Right, right. And, and, I mean, physically, how did they emerge to conquer so much? Well, again, the Ottomans emerged in the 13th century as the fastest moving army on the ground. When it was Chinggis Khan, right. the men on horses swept from Asia into... And they were related to... to Jungais, right? They in the sense that the Ottomans trace their origins back to the steppes of Central Asia. And so there is a sort of foundational myth that traces them back. I have no reason to dispute that myth. Yeah. But these are people who were far more interested in conquest than in writing. And they didn't leave us written records of their expansion into Anatolia. But you had a series of Turkic households emerging in one of the marchlands of the Byzantine Empire in the 13th century. And basically, the most disciplined, the most militarily successful were the Ottomans, and they expanded from the 13th into the 14th century until these men on horses began to really threaten the civilized world of Byzantium, the, the Christian Byzantine Empire. And that really becomes the spread of the Ottomans in the 14th and 15th century until the fall of Constantinople. Yeah. And how do they rule the Balkans? Um, I mean, uh, what were they noted for in the Balkans? I mean, dealing with a non-Muslim mm -hmm. population. Well, the Ottomans were not particularly ideologically driven. They were very pragmatic rulers. And so they tried to work with the dominant system of all the places they conquered. When it came to the Balkans, conversion came at a very slow rate. You were dealing with a population, the majority of which was Christian. So easier to work through the established churches, allow them to function as normal, what you wanted was for the people to be productive, for the farmers to have large harvests, and for them to pay taxes to the central government. Right. As long as order was kept, people produced, and taxes were paid, yeah. then the Ottoman state was happy to leave the finer detail of administration yeah. to bishops and to, to archimandrates. And 
the other contribution that the people in the Balkans made was to the Ottoman military and civil service. And this was by an annual levy of young Christian boys who would be taken by recruitment gangs. They would be converted to Islam. You couldn't enslave freeborn Muslims, but you could enslave Christians. But this was, of course, a slavery of power. So these young Christian boys would be taken back to Istanbul. Those who were fit would be trained for military service, and that would be one career path towards advancement. The other is if you were smart and not physically fit, then you'd be trained for the civil service. And here again, a slave could become a minister or indeed a grand vizier prime minister. This servile right. route to power was one of the distinctive features yeah. that bound the Balkans to the Ottoman Empire. Right. And, and tell me, I mean, what was their relationship with the Arabs? I mean, for all these centuries, uh, before, the, before the First World War, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, were the Arabs in, in revolt uh, against, did they see the Turks as oppressors? Um, what, what was the relationship? We have to remember that the Ottomans come to the Arab world in the 16th century. Uh, under Sultan Selim, they conquer first Greater Syria in 1516, and then they topple the Mamluk Sultanate of Cairo in 1517. And at that point, the difference between the Mamluk dynasty and the Ottoman dynasty was a fine point as far as most people in the Arab provinces were concerned. The Mamluk dynasty was Turkish-speaking as well. These were Sunni Muslims ruling over Sunni Muslim people. It was just, if you like, the latest iteration of an Islamic empire. And for most of the Islamic centuries, the Arab people went along with that. They were divided into provinces. Their provincial capitals would have governors dispatched from Istanbul. And you would say that for most of the Ottoman centuries, that system worked fine. In the 19th century, the Arab world was also caught up with the idea of national identity. And we see the beginnings at the very end of the 19th century of Arab Ottomans beginning to distinguish themselves from Turkish Ottomans and trying to negotiate more respect for the Arab culture and political rights and whatnot. But I would say it was, if you like, a modern nationalist projection on the past of modern Arabs blaming their subordinate place in the world on having been held back by the Ottomans. And I think the Ottomans coming out of the First World War look back on the Arabs as the subject peoples who betrayed them, betrayed that the them. Arab revolt of the First World War yeah. was a knife in the back of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Yeah. But those are 20th century realities. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, we come now to the First World War. I mean, you know, the situation just before the First World War was that the Ottomans were collapsing, mm -hmm. I mean, basically. The sick, man of Europe, uh, the sick man of Europe is what they were called. Am I the right? Russians yeah. coined that the, expression. The, the Russians Tsar Nicholas. And, um, and, and all the big powers around the Ottoman Empire, the, 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 the Western powers and Russia and Iran and all the rest, they all were trying to make a grab for parts of the Ottomans. How, how, how do you see that? Um, uh, I mean, give us some, some insight into that collapse. Why did it happen? Um, and and why, why didn't the Ottomans stand firmer against particularly the British when the British moved into the Middle East? It's such a good question, Ahmed. And, you know, I spend a lot of my professional career arguing against the notion of Ottoman decline or the sick man of Europe. Yeah. Yet when you come to the second decade of the 20th century, the Ottomans did look to be in a particularly weak position. They fought, they had a revolution in 1908 which restored the constitution to the Ottoman Empire and spelled the end of the autocratic rule of Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In the aftermath of that revolution, there was a sudden furious land grab of Ottoman Balkan territories by stronger neighbors like the Austrian Empire. And then no sooner had the Austrians taken their bit than the Ottomans found themselves at war with Italy, 1911, the Italians were keen to seize a bit of Mediterranean territory in Libya for their imperial aspirations, small as they were. And immediately after that, the Ottomans had to stop fighting Italy because the successor states in the Balkans had clubbed together to make war on the Ottoman Empire for the last European territories they held, which ran from Albania through Macedonia to Thrace, a narrow band of Balkan territory, but against Serbia, 
Bulgaria, Montenegro, Greece, the Ottomans found that they couldn't defeat even their former provincial territories. These small successor states were able to conquer the Ottomans, take the last of their territory in the First Balkan War. And at that point, it wasn't just the Europeans who were saying, this country is on its way out. Many in Ottoman Turkey itself believed that their empire had reached a terminal phase of decline and would not be able to pull out before the final crash. And, and what did the young Turks, who we heard a lot about, what did the young Turks achieve? I mean, did, was this an attempt to salvage the empire? Mm. Or was this an attempt to create a modern Turkey? Well, the young Turks are fascinating. They are, in a sense, the first of the military coups in the Middle East. And like so many of the other military coups, they were able to plan the overthrow of a government without having the confidence to rule in their own right. And so from 1908 to 1913, for five years after the Young Turk Revolution, the Young Turks basically stand back as a sort of guardianship council. In 1913, at the height of all of the drama in the Balkan War, the Young Turks actually decide that they will take power. And they organize a sort of coup in the Sublime Court. They force the Grand Vizier to step down. And from that point on, the Young Turks will rule the Ottoman Empire. They do so sharing the duties of state between three key players. You have Talat Pasha, who will be interior minister and then Grand Vizier. You have Enver Pasha, minister of war. And you have Jamal Pasha, who's minister of marine. And these three men are going to, in their separate ways, take their patriotic aspirations apply it to the Ottoman Empire in a way which draws them into the First World War and ultimately will lead to the disaster yeah. that will lead to the breakup. It was, if you like, with the best of intentions, the undoing of the Ottoman Empire. Of course, what is you know, so fascinating is the whole Arab revolt and the relationship with the Hashemites who, who led the Arab revolt. Um, uh, aided by, you know, who we know very well, Lawrence of Arabia. Good auction, man. And, <laughs> and, and, and other such characters. But um, this whole, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Hashemites are for a time successful. Um, and then you get the arrival of the Saudis, who are, uh, the British have pledged loyalty to the Hashemites, that there will be an Arab kingdom, we will create an Arab kingdom out of uh, Syria and Iraq. Um, and at the same time, the British are quietly canoodling with uh, King Saud of, of uh, the you know, Ibn Saud of uh, Saudi Arabia, um, who eventually comes into the Hejaz, western of uh, Arabia, and throws out the Hashemites. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this set, a, a t this created a terrible reputation for the British, as double dealing. I mean, with everyone, as it were. In writing my book, I had to re-examine Britain's many relations across the Arab world against the background of Arab colleagues who have long told me about the double talk and the betrayals. Yeah. So a large part of the book does deal with the wartime partition diplomacy and the promises that Britain is making to all of its different allies. And it's not that I have any bias in favor of Britain, but I take a slightly more understanding line yeah. that Britain, through the course of the war, I mean, it basically, it enters World War I with absolutely zero territorial ambitions in the Ottoman Empire. The, the first partition agreement is struck just before the Gallipoli campaign between Britain, France, and Russia. It's Russia that starts everything by saying, gentlemen, we're going to take the Ottoman capital shortly, and we want to add it to the Russian Empire, along with the European coasts of the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and the Dardanelles, so we have access from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. The British and the French say, these are big demands, the richest prize of the whole war, but we'll give you that. Yeah. France says, we'll say yes on condition that we get Syria and Cilicia. Yeah. I couldn't tell you what the boundaries of those two territories are because those were words that the Romans used for geography. Yeah. They're not modern words. Yeah. And the British at that point say, we'll concede to French demands and Russian demands on condition that we can claim equal strategic territory as and when we decide what we want. But they start the war in 1915 with no clear idea of any territorial demands. Okay? They then do a very British thing. They convene a commission of inquiry to work out exactly what it is that they do want in the Ottoman Empire. It's called the Debunson Committee. 
and in the course of the war, it will be Mesopotamia mm -hmm. that becomes mm -hmm. their focus of interest. But it starts a whole process where the British are engaged in two things. They're desperate to win the war. And I think you have to remember, when we talk about British betrayals and double talk, it's against the background of a murderous conflict that is draining the lifeblood out of each of the combatant nations, not just Britain, but the Germans, the Austrians, the French, the Russians. They're all bleeding on an industrial scale. And so anyone in any position of power who can make any deal that might make any material difference to winning that war yeah. is doing their patriotic duty. So understand it in that context. Two, in that de Bunsen committee report, Britain acknowledges that while it might be allied at the moment with Russia and France, they're very likely to be rivals in the future. And so Britain is very concerned in its wartime partition diplomacy to strike a balance of power, not with the region, but between empires, because they imagine the imperial age that entered World War I would be the same after World War I. They wanted to preserve a balance of power between empires. And if you take those two premises, and a third, none of the deals that we talk about with the Hashemites, with Sykes-Picot, with Balfour Declaration, would ever have been made in peacetime. I mean, they're all lunatic agreements in their own rights. If you take them as ink on paper, they're lunatic agreements. So no one would have done them in their right minds in peacetime. Then you begin to understand why Britain is promising territory left, right, and center to as many different candidates. Israel included. It, well, it, not Israel at that point, but the yeah. Zionist movement, the movement, Balfour Declaration. Yeah. It's all about trying to secure alliances, yeah. to try and make a meaningful advantage on the war, yeah. and to try and keep France yeah. or Russia actively engaged in the war. Yeah. Against all that, I think we can understand um, where the Hashemites and British came to. Before I, I, I get to the modern era, I mean, um, just to briefly look at Kamal the Turk, I mean, you know, uh, given the ah, cometh the man kind of thing, you know, I mean, Turkey was in a state of collapse and, and uh, uh, it, the danger of Turkey being partitioned uh, by the Russians and other powers. And then Ataturk arrives and uh, takes command, takes control. Um, and of course that, you know, he becomes a kind of symbol for uh, the man on horseback uh, who arrives and, and saves the nation. Uh, we've had a lot of that in our history also, uh, unfortunately. And invariably it doesn't lead to much saving of the nation. It leads to more problems and more chaos. It's okay, um, Ahmed. We've got Mr. Trump who's promising to make America great again. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen anything no. in Pakistan yet. Yeah, yeah. So um, tell me you know, a, a, a bit about the internal politics of, of, of Turkey. Mm -hmm. And how, how does... Uh, uh, Kemal Atatürk become such a popular hero? Well, let's call him Mustafa Kemal. Yeah. That was his name when he entered the First World War. Right. And Mustafa Kemal was like Enver and Talat and Jamal, a committed young Turk. And then the question is, why was he left out of the loop in the inner circle, those who really ran the, the Ottoman Pasha. Empire, these yeah. three Pashas that we mentioned? Yeah. He had a tremendous success commanding Ottoman forces in Gallipoli. Right. He came out of the Gallipoli campaign, celebrated as the most influential Ottoman commander to deliver victory against the greatest armies of the world. The Ottomans defeated the British and the French in Gallipoli. And that was very much something that was to his credit. And he was to go on to serve a very distinguished career through the rest of the First World War. He was involved in Syria in the defense of, against uh, the British he was part of the Yildirim fusion of German and Ottoman forces, so a very distinguished career. He was able, at the end of the war, he was sent on a mission after the signing of the armistice to demobilize Ottoman soldiers returning from Arab provinces and from the Caucasus regions uh, to disarm them in line with the armistice terms and to restore calm to Anatolia. But as he sets off to Samsung to demobilize, he gets word of the arrival of Greek forces in the Izmir region. And this motivates his patriotism to disregard his orders. Instead of demobilizing, he begins to mobilize. So here we have the successful general, charismatic leader. And now I'm going to shift gears and say, actually, when you read my book, he gets a bit of attention. Yeah. 
but, 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 but I'm going to move overwhelming, not yeah. overwhelmingly because yeah. to me what was even more astonishing than the success of Mustafa Kemal yeah. is the willingness of the average Mehmet Chik. this is the affectionate name by which the Anatolian Turkish soldier was known the little yeah. Mehmeds what in God's name motivated men who had since 1911, 1912 been caught up in a relentless cycle of terrible wars they suffered such Casual hardship time. such high levels of casualties you would have thought that this least well provided army with the least material the least resources would have collapsed after defeat in the first world war and yet they rally for one more struggle and this becomes a Turkish war of independence yeah. against Greece France the Armenians yeah. Even against the British, small presence as they were at that point. It, I'm, I was reminded, leader, but the Mehmed Sheikh is the one that we should be celebrating. I, I was reminded of the Russians. I mean, you know, uh, when uh, I mean the Russian army basically deserted the battlefield yeah. one, and, and and gave the Bolsheviks a whole opportunity which was not there before. And I was very surprising why it didn't happen with the Turks as well. It's astonishing. I mean, if you read the figures of these battles and the losses. I mean, you would think that the whole of Turkey had just been wiped out. Absolutely. It's an extraordinary figures. But they managed to rally one more time yeah. and to prosecute their ultimate successful war yeah. of all of the defeated countries in the First World War. It was only Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, yeah. that was able to go back to the victorious powers and renegotiate the treaty. And this becomes the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, recognizing Turkey in yeah. its modern frontiers, more or less. Yeah. So let's let's come to the modern era. I mean, obviously, the I mean, your your book doesn't tackle that, but um, obviously, all this history begs the question as to where are we today in the Middle East, and um, uh, why didn't the you know the Arab Spring take off? Now, I just want to remind everyone that if you remember, after the Arab Spring, the the hero of the hour was actually Turkey and Erdogan. Um, Turkey was the model. Here was here was a country that was. Uh, Turning it, becoming an Islamic state. It was modern, it was moderate. Uh, they educated their women and had gave uh, jobs for women. Um, the Turks were seeming, and this is what the Arabs wanted to copy, wanted to emulate. They wanted a modern Islamic state mm -hmm. with Islamic values. Um, and, and Turkey was the hero uh, for, for a short time, mm -hmm. at least. And then, of course, dictatorship returns to the Middle East dictatorship in Egypt, in Syria, in, in um, Syria dissolves into civil war, in, in, in Iraq, um, and, and, and that Turkish model of moderation, if you like, or a moderate kind of Islam, uh, disappears too. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what happens? I mean, in Turkey under the AKP had been a real role model for any country that had a strong Islamic political movement, but was hoping to bridge Islam and democracy by sticking true to your indigenous values and culture. AKP was a party in a multi-party political scene that had won elections, always on the understanding that should they lose the election, they would stand down and someone else would take their place. This broke what many had assumed to be the limits of Islamic political parties, that once in office they would not cede power to non-Islamist parties as a matter of religious duty. AKP seemed to hold out the prospect that you could be Islamic and dem democratic and be in a um, diverse political spectrum that involves secular and religious parties. And I think for a lot of the people in 2011 in the Arab world, that was the image they had. And the politics had worked really well in Turkey because the economy was booming in Turkey. So you'd like to have the kind of growth figures that Turkey under AKP was enjoying in excess of 10%. Secondly, AKP had succeeded in curbing the power of the military over politics in Turkey. And this was the kind of achievement that would elude every Arab state in the Arab Spring. They, none of them were able to come out of the shadow of the power of the military except Tunisia, where the military had never been involved in politics. Um, and so people looked to AKP as a role model. More than anyone, though, it was those Islamist parties that were ideologically closest aligned to the AKP's own politics. And here I'm thinking of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt 
and the different franchises associated to the Muslim Brotherhood spread across North Africa and the Levant. And for them, the AKP was their natural partner. And the Arab Spring seemed to be the moment that allowed Islam, is, is Muslim Brotherhood type parties to come to the forefront of politics in each of the revolutionary situations. But as we know, revolution across the Arab world was followed by counter-revolution. This wave of Muslim Brotherhood enthusiasm crashed and in counter-revolution was swept away. And so the AKP's attraction and its influence as a role model diminished as, as a result. And I think what we spoke about earlier, a 20th century projection of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire having held the Arabs back and a kind of antagonism between Arabs and Turks was to take its place. Today, you'll find very little warmth shown, let us say, between Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or Egypt and Turkey. Um, it proved to be a short moment of fraternity. How, how, how did uh, the Brotherhood curb the role of the military in, in Turkey? Um, I mean, you know, it's an it's a example that also we look at very closely. I mean, how did they do it? Well, again, a AKP, not the Brotherhood. The yeah. Brotherhood's never had the power to curb the military, yeah. say, in Egypt. But, but wasn't the AKP a, a Brotherhood uh, party or a Brotherhood allied party? You know, I think it was a party whose vision of Islam and politics was close enough to that of the Muslim Brotherhood. But there, there are no institutional ties between right. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. No, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I think AKP emerges from its own genealogy in right. Turkey. But right. you can see where their worldviews were close enough right. that they could see each other as fraternal movements. Right. But, in, in essence, it's, it's a really important question. Uh, I could say that the AKP broke the power of the military through conspiracy theories. They put many leading generals in Turkey on trial for a conspiracy against the government, again, Ekran. But that begs the question, what gave them the power to arrest and put on trial top-ranking generals? And I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know how it was. And how did the judiciary go along with that? Because the judiciary must have been in league with the generals. Again, this is a degree of infiltration of two institutions, the police, the military, or three, the police, the military, and the judiciary, that AKP was able to achieve in partnership with the Gülen movement, with which now AKP is at loggerheads. Clear hostility there. But you could say that in the first decade of AKP rule, there had been a strong infiltration of all three of those institutions by AKP and Gülenist cadres which was to allow them to shift the balance of power so that they could actually take on the military through rule of law institutions right. and win. Well, I, I, let me just ask you one question that has always bothered me. Why are the Turks so fanatically... Well, now, when the, when the Ottomans were so much uh, in favor of their minorities and, and gave them you know, equal rights almost, why do we have the Turks now massacring the Armenians after the, during the First World War, mass massacring the Kurds? Why are the Turks so intolerant of any kind of minority? Um, you know, is this a mac macho sort of culture? Is this something they've inherited? Um, where does it come from? All right. Well, I mean, I, I would dispel any myth of macho culture. Yeah. And I'd like to separate out the genocide of Armenians in World War I from the tensions that have emerged between Kurds and Turks in the end of the 20th century and have reemerged now. So let's take those separately. I mean, the Armenians occupy center stage in my book as the greatest civilian suffering of the war. And I try to contextualize why a genocide happened. And it comes very much in terms of an Ottoman struggle against minority communities who no longer accepted <clears throat> that Ottoman social contract, a pay your taxes, we'll leave you to run your own show. Right. But had begun to aspire to self-rule that led to separatism that had fragmented Ottoman rule in the Balkans. The Armenians were different because they lived in the Ottoman Turkish heartland of Anatolia. The project for the Armenians before World War I was an autonomous self-rule area in six provinces in the easternmost part of Turkey. In those six provinces, you had the majority of Armenians, 
but in no one province were the Armenians a majority, 20 to 30 percent. So it was a project that would put Sunni Muslims, mostly Kurds and Turks, yeah. under the government of Armenians in what was for the Turks absolute heartland. It was not negotiable territory. This is Anatolia. This is Turkish heartland. And this was backed by Russian support. With the outbreak of the war, with Russia identified as enemy number one, the conflicted position the Armenians found themselves in of Russians offering support to the Armenians, calling them to cross sides, to abandon the Ottoman army, to join the Russian army, made them into a perceived fifth column, which sets the context for genocide. I stress in saying this, that the fifth column argument is made by many who deny genocide, and that is not my aim. I, I stress that a genocide takes place. It was something that was recorded by Ottomans already at the end of the war. We shouldn't be talking about it now. But it's my job as a historian to try and explain why a genocide took place then and there. And it's quite different from the tensions with the Kurds of the 20th century, except in one essential point, which is, again, this notion that when cultural identity begins to lead to separatist movements through nationalism, then it becomes an existential threat to the integrity of the state. And the Kurds are seen today as such a community, with their separate language, their separate culture, their separate identity, that if given their cultural autonomy, it will encourage a nationalism that will lead to secession. And again, a territory in Anatolia that the Turks deem indivisible. So they are an existential threat, and the Turks fight them accordingly. So you're saying that this is not some ingrained sort of uh, Turkish model of, of manipulating minorities and dealing with them. This is a, a result of history and the way these groups have evolved. Really. Absolutely so. And, right. and we know that there is no force stronger than nationalism to make yeah. people behave in violent and irrational ways. Right. Maybe re religion can do the yeah. same. But I mean, in modern times, nationalism yeah. is yeah. the force that yeah. has us abandon our humanity for abstract issues. Finally, what, what influence do the Ottomans have on modern day Turkey? And, and the rulers of Turkey. I mean, people keep saying that Erdogan is another, you know, sultan, and he's an, he acts like an Ottoman king and all. I mean, d does that bear any resemblance to, to what Turks actually think? Western media is full of this. I mean, um, and I wondered what the, how the Turks would see it. It's a complex thing, because there's no doubt that Erdogan plays on the kind of symbolic value of the Ottoman Empire as part of his propaganda. Yeah. He's created a presidential guard that wear historic uniforms. <laughs> it looks bizarre, yeah. but he likes it. He has built himself an enormous presidential palace, and he seems very happy to have it referred to as the, the Sultan's Palace. Yeah. And he doesn't go to great lengths to dispel people jokingly referring to him as a sultan. Yeah. So to him, the idea that you could once again be a power led by Turks that could dominate world affairs would be to the greater glory of an AKP-led Turkey. Yeah. But there are many other Turks still very committed to the secular nationalist values of Ataturk. Yeah. They tend to live in the big cities. You'll find them in Ankara. You'll find them in Istanbul. You'll find them in Izmir who reject categorically any symbolism of Ottomanism being positive to them, that is backwardness. That is everything that the modern Turkish Republic struggled to put behind them and to build an industrialized, Modern modernized, state. globalized, very modern state. And any attempt to try and look backwards with nostalgia is a danger to the welfare of the nation that they would like to struggle against for all their worth. It's not getting them very far politically. They keep, in their fragmented small parties, losing to AKP. And they'll need to get their act together if they ever want to play right. alternate politics again. Right. But they, in their voting appeal, if you add all their parties together, are so close to parity with AKP that were they to do so, there could be a rebalancing of Turkish politics. Right. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, could we have some lights, please? So I can see. Ah, yes, good. Yeah, sure. I, well, wait for the microphone. Uh, wait for the microphone. And, and ladies, if you could bring us some microphones down.
<coughs> prepare the next one perhaps. Professor, yeah. My name is Shahid Hassan. What if the Ottomans had not been forced to lift the siege of Vienna and it had succeeded? What do you think would have been the consequences for the Western civilization and for the Ottoman Empire? So the question is, what do I think would have happened had the Ottomans succeeded in their 1683 siege of Vienna? I mean, I think that you would still find donor kebabs on the streets of Vienna. <laughs> I think by the time you came to the siege of Vienna, the reason for Ottoman defeat had far more to do with the limits of logistics in that early modern military age. It demonstrated how far the Sultan could mobilize troops and the required materiel to conduct a campaign. And I think Vienna is about as far as they could go without more modern means of transport. And also, I think they'd reach the limits of what they might be able to hold were they to conquer. No sooner did they retreat from Vienna that they were, than they were engaged in 15 years of war with both Russia and Austria, which forced the Ottomans by the end of the century to sign the first treaty in which they actually had to surrender Muslim land in the Crimean Khanate in the north of the Black Sea. So the Ottomans had, if you like, reached the f heights of what they could hold on to, and they would spend the 18th century in conflict with strong neighbors who were developing new military technologies that were proving superior to those of the Ottomans and would begin to push the Ottomans back in both Caucasus and Balkan territories. So it would have been dramatic had they taken Vienna, but I don't think it would have been enduring. Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned that the, the Erdogan is trying to recreate the Ottoman glory. Speak into the microphone. Just by your mouth. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you know Erdogan is trying to recreate the glory of uh, the Ottoman uh, era, but in the question of the Armenian genocide, they claim successive Turkish present-day governments claim that. They are the Republic of Turkey and quite distinct from the Ottoman Empire during whose reign the, the so-called uh, genocide occurred. So is it a question of these people sort of taking pick and choose whenever it suits them, they, they go back to the glory days and sometimes when it doesn't suit them, they just uh, distance themselves from that era? It's a very good question and I don't know that I have a good answer for you. I've never understood why the current government of Turkey did not distance itself from the Armenian Genocide in the same way that, for instance, the German Democratic Republic of East Germany distinguished themselves from the Nazis in the Holocaust. They acknowledged the Holocaust, they were critical of it, but they said, that was the old Nazis. We are now, you know, the socialist German Democratic Republic. That's not part of our history or legacy. We struggle against it. The, the modern Turkish Republic could do the same. A very quick anecdote. I wondered in writing about the Armenian Genocide whether I was disinviting myself from future visits to Turkey. As it turns out, that wasn't the case. And I was invited to a think tank in Ankara to speak precisely on the Armenian Genocide. This surprised me. I had a talk. It was a small workshop of 30 people. It was hosted by the Chamber of Commerce of Turkey. Uh, there's a central, you know, each city has its own chamber of commerce. This is the central board. I had this think tank. And at the end, I was like, this was a very interesting day for me, but what was this all about? And they said, we're a chamber of commerce. The most impoverished part of Turkey is the northeast. There are Armenian cities there that are very attractive to Armenian tourists from around the world. We believe that if we could get the Armenian genocide behind us, we could attract people in a way that would revitalize that part of the country. It also would be a great way for us to encourage Black Sea trade by opening war links with Armenia itself, the Armenian Republic. If we can get the history behind us, then we can see where it would bring benefit to the Turkish Republic. And the way you've written the history is respectful of the Ottoman Empire's war effort, but talks about a genocide. So we thought maybe you could help us to see a way you could put a historical narrative forward that would allow us to go beyond the problem of history and do business.
And I think that that might be the way forward, is when they can devise an interest that will allow them to acknowledge what happened historically and move beyond it, not as a neo-Ottoman state, but as a Turkish Republic. Right, yeah. <clears throat> Girls, can we have one down here? Yeah, please go ahead. Sp speak up, please. I think the mic's off. Yeah, the mic's off. Yes. Okay. Um, talking about modern day Turkey, um, after curbing the political strength or ambition or interference of the um, uh, Turkish army and resulting into social economical gains by Turkey, um, do you think there's any um, um, downward uh, um, trend towards the strength of uh, the Turkish military after um, the curbing of their political powers. Yeah. I want to relate it with the, uh, other countries um, where the army is either king or king makers um, and this argument that if you try to control and curb the armies or uh, the military strength uh, this will result in the weakness of uh, the defense of the country. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> I think that we saw before 2013 a successful effort to curb the army of Turkey's political power and to reinforce the loyalty of the military to the government. But, as I said before, there had been an infiltration of the military, of the judiciary, of the police, not just by AKP supporters, but by Gulen supporters. And when we came to the attempted coup in the summer of 2016, there has been a purge of the military and of all ranks of the bureaucracy, civil service, the administration, the courts, the police, universities, schools, which has made the government in Turkey very vulnerable, and not just the military in Turkey very vulnerable. <clears throat> that was sustainable as long as the Turkish economy continued to be strong. But we've seen in the past 18 months how bad policies by the government have taken away the confidence of the Turkish lira. So the economy itself is shrinking, and there's been a massive revaluation of lira, much to the disadvantage of the Turkish uh, import-export markets and economy. So I think we might have seen a government that's overplayed its hand. That has weakened too many institutions, including the military. That's weakened its economy. That's weakened the cohesion of the state. And then the question is, what will be the force that will keep Erdogan in power now that he has his constitutional mandate to do so against so many enemies? Um, I, I can't say that I can predict another coup, and I can't tell you that the military is completely out of politics. They still are vowed to uphold the guiding principles of the Turkish state, which were put in place by Ataturk. And in a recent visit to Turkey, going to Ataturk's grave to watch military men come in great numbers to pay their respects to Ataturk tells you that this tradition is not gone, even under AKP. And so I think that the Turkish example of what one might hope to do in terms of curbing the military might prove limited. I would be anxious to observe what the military does in coming years and to see whether it doesn't play a role in redressing the imbalance in Turkey right now and the power vacuum that's emerging. Well, you know, I mean, the, rep the, the repression... The repression has been... He just went off. Has it gone off? Uh-huh. And now you're live. The repression, remember, has been absolutely staggering. I mean, the 60,000 prisoners in Turkish jails from the professional classes, lawyers, educators, journalists, judges, um, the entire middle class has been um, uh, shattered by uh, what is going on. And of course, the human rights abuses and the condemnation of Turkey by um, all sorts of powers. Uh, and I mean, there are people going on trial uh, I read a report the other day that 200 people were on trial in a single room with a single judge. Yeah. And, the, and these people were going to be given sentences collectively. Yeah. 
All of them were guilty of, of, of one charge and that there was no investigation. Their lawyers weren't allowed to make statements. Um, it, it's quite a horrendous situation. Amina, uh, please. Kamal Atatürk's uh, policy of uh, modernizing uh, things, including uh, romanizing the Turkish alphabet. So did that result in um, uh, a loss of uh, Turkey's literary heritage because people can't read all, the, all that literature? Thank you very much. Again, the question of romanizing the alphabet and Turkifying the language was characterized by my late colleague, Jeffrey Lewis, as a catastrophic success. <laughs> and I think he's captured the positives and negatives in that title. The success is in literacy. At the time, 1926, 27, literacy would have been under 20%. It probably was under 15%. At the, within 20 years of Romanizing, they'd quadrupled <clears throat> literacy in, the Ottoman, uh, in, in modern Turkey. And what that allows you to do in terms of an educated population is essential for understanding future developments and successes in Turkey. So there is your success. But your question talked about a loss of culture and heritage. And I think that's what Jeffrey Lewis was referring to as the catastrophe. Because the wall that Romanizing put between modern Turks and the centuries of poetry of belles lettres, of history, of a vocabulary that drew equally on Persian and Arabic loanwords in a way that will be familiar to all who speak Urdu. This was an impoverishing of Turkish culture and a barrier between modern Turks and their past, which could only be reckoned a catastrophe. I have a question. Uh, my name is Dr. Asir Edmel. I'm a psychologist. Uh, I would be interested in knowing what you think of uh, Central Asian people and their relationship or their view of modern Turkey. Uh, is there a sort of phenomenon like the Turkic Spring ever a possibility? My answer will be brief in that it reflects my ignorance. But there is certainly a sense in Turkey that Central Asia is a natural hinterland for its influence because of a common Turkic culture that binds the ling languages of Central Asian states with some Central Asian states with Turkey. How you actualize that is another matter. And I don't see any initiatives, meaningful initiatives, to try and do so politically, though I know trade relations are important. But beyond that, I, I really regretfully must decline out of ignorance to say more. Well, I, I, I can tell you I visited Central Asia a lot starting just before the collapse of the Soviet Union during Gorbachev's time. And the Turkish companies were rushing into Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is our, this is our backyard. We want, we want to build all the palaces and the hotels and um, all the airports and the big infrastructure that you missed out on because you were under Soviet rule. And, but, you know, a, a couple of years later, when I went back to the same places, there were no Turkish companies at all. And they'd all pulled out because they'd not got paid. Mm. Uh, I mean, these regimes uh, had forgotten to pay for what, for what the Turks had built. And as you can imagine, the Turks were really upset. Yeah. And, um, you know, there, all these companies swore never to go back into Central Asia. But you're right. I mean, there is a, rela a very close relation. I, I would say it's a kind of romantic relationship between uh, the Turks and Central Asia. There are some hardline groups who believe that um, Central Asia should be part of uh, the rehash of the, of the Turkish Empire. Um, but... Uh, uh, basically, there's, there's uh, I think, a nostalgia, a romanticism that is involved, um, which is still strong. I mean, if you look at uh, the Turks looking after General Dostum in Afghanistan, I mean, you can't imagine anybody worse as, as, a, as a guest in your house than, than General Dostum. You know, he gets drunk, he beats up everyone, he smashes the furniture. Um, but the Turks take him on because, you know, He's, he's, he speaks Uzbek, which is a Turkic language, and um, uh, that is the role that Turkey plays in northern Afghanistan. 
So it's, it's not gone yet entirely. Yeah. So can we have one, one more? Uh, my question is about, uh, in fact... Uh, can you stand up? I can't see you. First ah. of all, I must thank uh, for, for the benefit I have taken from a great historian. Uh, I wish to know more about uh, the German influence in Turkish policies uh, during the Ottoman period and also what happened to this part of the world as Khilafat movement. And part of it is uh, reflected in Turkish uh, interest in the uh, fears of Uyghurs in China and where Pakistan is standing today between Chinese interest and Turkish interest. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, Germany was the essential partner for the Ottoman Empire. And it was Germany that drew the Ottomans into the First World War, largely out of Ottoman fears of Russia. Basically, when war breaks out, the Ottomans rec recognized that if they didn't get a strong European ally to protect them against Russian ambitions, then Russia was going to come and take their capital city. So drawn into the war, the Ottomans relied very heavily on German military training, the provision of modern weapons to carry out their war effort. They had a number of important German generals who were seconded to military service in the Ottoman Empire, and they made a really important contribution. There has been a tendency in the scholarship to give the Germans credit for whatever went right in the Ottoman war effort and then to blame any defeat on the Turks themselves. And I think that's always been a distortion of the historic record. The number of German officers in Ottoman service were always so small. They were very important, they were influential, but in no way were they determining Ottoman war strategy or war policy. And here I think I would give credit squarely to uh, Ottoman commanders for what went on, successful or unsuccessful, as it proved in the course of the war. There are also accounts made of German influence on the Ottomans at the time of the Armenian Genocide. I think in that there is a bit of a projection of the Holocaust experience of the Third Reich back on the uh, genocide against Armenians in the First World War. All we, all we can say from the evidence is that when German officers knew of the collective gathering and massacring of Armenians. They didn't interfere, viewing it as an internal Ottoman matter and wanting to concentrate Ottoman energies on prosecuting the war. And in that sense, they were guilty of neglect rather than actively encouraging the measures against Armenians. But I wouldn't draw any links anymore. I wouldn't say that the Germans are more of a genocidal people the, the Turks being a, a bloody people, you know, it's specific context and specific historic moments that take place. One, one last question, quickly. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Rogan, in your talk, you referred to Treaty of Lausanne. Uh, it's treaty is ending actually in 2023, uh, so I would like to have your speculation about it. I'm so sorry, I couldn't quite understand your question. Uh, the Treaty of Lausanne is ending in 2023. Right. Right? So what's your speculation about it? So the, what is my... Reference my, to Turkey and a uh, reference around uh, the coming, world politics. Coming from the Treaty of Lausanne. Yes, yes. Hmm. I mean, the Ottoman Empire faced a very draconian treaty at the Paris Peace Conference known as the Treaty of Sèvres. And the Treaty of Sèvres not only severed all of the Arab provinces from the Ottoman Empire, but it also carved up Anatolia, Turkey, between an Armenian enclave, a Kurdish enclave, territory under French administration, territory under Italian administration, a Greek enclave. It reduced the Ottoman Empire to Istanbul and the Black Sea coasts and areas of central Anatolia that no one else wanted. This was not worse than, let's say, what happened to the Habsburg Empire which was carved up into many different states. This is when Austria emerges with Czechoslovakia as a neighbor and Yugoslavia and the other successor states. So this is what the victorious powers did. And the Ottomans were told at the time they signed the Treaty of Sèvres that if they didn't abide by the letter of the treaty, 
they were in imminent risk of losing their capital city, Constantinople, Istanbul, which was granted to the Ottoman state, uh, as it were, on, on sufferance. This is what leads to the break between the Ottoman government in Istanbul and the Kemalist movement in Ankara. The Kemalists were obviously patriots and nationalists, but the Sultan and his government thought that they were being very rash because in raising a war to fight against the Treaty of Sevres, they put at risk the remaining bits of the Ottoman Empire that had been left to the Sultan and his government. And so Mustafa Kemal and his partisans were tried in absentia, they were convicted of treason, and they were sentenced to death in absentia. Okay. The Sultan and his government wanted to abide by the Treaty of Sevres to keep such last remaining territories as they had. In the end, it proves that it was Mustafa Kemal that was right, that the only way you would actually be able to emerge from that draconian settlement as a sound and enduring country was by resisting the, PD, the, the peace terms uh, of, of the Treaty of Sevres. Was the lesson of that that maybe Austria or Germany should have done the same? I think not. I mean, I think that the distance that separated Turkey from the rest of Europe at a time when Europe was so keen to demobilize its exhausted soldiers that, that they were in a position to achieve what no other of the defeated parties could. And I think that, that success was what they brought back to the Treaty of Lausanne. And in that treaty, you know, you have recognition of the Turkish Republic, which would prove to be an enduring feature of the past century. So, but I think it was a success that was unique to the Turkish movement. I don't think that there are any other states that could have learned a lesson from Lausanne where resistance could lead to reward such as that. Well, le let me quickly, quickly, um, let me just say that I hope this conversation has helped fill a gap in, 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 in many of your minds. Certainly it has filled a huge gap in my mind regarding um, the Ottomans and uh, relating that to modern Turkey. And, yeah, we've got one. Be, yeah. be very quick. Yeah, our time is over. Yeah. So, 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 the war remains independent due to the British diplomacy and their support to the Ottomans. You know what I'd like to do is if I could take the two last yeah, questions. We yeah. are out of time, yeah. but come meet me up front and we'll take those questions directly. Yeah. Okay. What, what's your question? I have got a question that uh, we are normally very romantic about the Ottoman Empire and uh, especially if we visit Istanbul and see all those big buildings, oh wow, what they built. But when we see history that one, in this part of the world we have this Ottoman Empire and very next to them there was Renaissance and post-Renaissance science and literature with their Leonardo da Vinci, Angelo, Newton. Yeah, get, 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 to to the question. get to the question. Why, why don't we have such figures under the rule of Ottoman Empire? I, I think you take that out uh, later. I'll just take yeah. it down here. I'm glad you got to ask yeah. it. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to thank Professor you. Eugene. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I hope we take away some lessons as we ponder the future in Pakistan as to how we will develop. We, we will continue to look at the Turks as, as an example, as a model, um, uh, perhaps less so than before. But uh, understanding Turkey is profoundly important for Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.